Here we're going to look at a little more complicated example of using the mesh current method to solve a complicated circuit. In this circuit we're going to have a super mesh to contend with. Alright, so the first step that we always use when using the mesh current method is to identify the meshes and indicate an assumed direction of current flow. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm first going to start with the meshes. Remember, the meshes are the smallest loops in a circuit. I'm going to start with the meshes that contain the voltage supplies because voltage supplies give us a good indication of the direction of current flow. So in this mesh right here, since the positive supply starts right here, I'm going to assume that current flows from the positive supply around the mesh to the negative side of the supply. I'm going to call this mesh or this mesh current I sub A. Right, right here, again I'm going to assume that current is going to flow from the positive side of the power supply to the negative side of the power supply. And I'm going to call this mesh I sub D, recognizing that we have four meshes. All right, we have two other meshes that we need to identify and indicate an assumed direction of current flow. Now, in this case, it's going to be fairly arbitrary. Since we do have this current supply right here, I'm going to assume that current is going to flow in this mesh, which I'm going to call I sub B, in the clockwise direction. Likewise, since we have an independent current supply right here, I'm going to assume that current is going to flow in mesh I sub C, also in the clockwise direction. Remember that these are arbitrary direction assignments and if we uh, assumed an incorrect direction it will show up when we do our calculations. Okay, so I have four meshes and I know that from the mesh current method that I should need four independent equations. But luckily for us, if we look a little bit closer, we see that we already know the current that flows through mesh I sub C because through this 10 amp current supply right here, the only current the only mesh current that flows through that 10 amp current supply is I sub C. So we can go ahead and say that the current through mesh C is equal to 10 amps. All right, so we're already set. We've reduced the number of equations from four down to three equations. Okay, so now we're gonna start with three equations, three mesh equations that we need to solve for IA, IB, and ID now. Unfortunately, we also see that IA and IB share a current supply between them. And when this happens, we create what is called a super mesh. All right? When that happens, what we do is we're going to reduce the number of equations that we need, the number of mesh equations that we need by one, but we also need to add a constraint equation. All right, so all told, we're going to need two mesh equations and one constraint equation. Thankfully, we don't have any dependent current or voltage supplies in this circuit, which would require the addition of uh, more constraint equations. So all told, we need two mesh equations and one constraint equation. One mesh equation is going to end up being mesh for mesh ID. And the second mesh equation is going to be the super mesh combination of IA and IB. And since we're going to have to combine mesh A and B together, we're going to need to develop another constraint equation to deal with the fact that we lose an independent equation. So we're going to start off with the easy one first. We're going to do, um, we're going to develop the mesh D uh, equation. All right, so mesh D is right here. And remember that for mesh D, as with all meshes that we're going to uh, use the mesh current method, we need to start using Kirchhoff's voltage law. And Kirchhoff's voltage law says that the sum of all of the potential gains and losses around a loop must sum to zero. Okay? So right here we have a potential gain of 30 volts across this uh, voltage supply. So right off the bat, we have 30 volts, and all of those 30 vo all of that 30 volts of potential must be dropped across all of the remaining resistors in the mesh. All right, so 30 volts must be equal to the potential dropped across resistor four plus the potential dropped across resistor five plus the potential dropped across resistor six. 
So now I am going to use um, Ohm's law to rewrite these voltages in terms of the unknown mesh currents. So let's start with the potential drop across R4. All right, since we're working with mesh D, I'm going to assume that mesh D is the dominant current here. So the current through R4 is the sum of the current ID. And now I'm going to look at the assumed direction of flow for mesh IB. Assume, based on my assumptions of direction, both of those current flows go in the same direction, so they're going to add to each other. So the total current flow is going to be ID plus IB multiplied by the resistance of R4, which is 5 ohms. Repeating the same analysis for resistor 5, I see that ID flows in the same direction as the assumed direction for IC. And we also know that IC is 10 amps. So I can write the current through R5 as being the unknown current in mesh D plus 10 amps multiplied by 20 ohms. The only um, current that flows through R6 is ID, so the potential developed across that resistor can be written as the mesh current multiplied by its resistance. And all of that, again, must sum to 30 volts. <clears throat> Knowing yet again that I'm going to need some matrix solution here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this equation that will be, rewrite this equation in a form that will be uh, conducive for a matrix solution. So when I do my algebraic manipulations on this equation, I will wind up with 5 ohms multiplied by IB plus 35 ohms multiplied by ID is going to be equal to this, there's a 200 um, volt, uh, 200 volts is developed right here. I'm going to move that to the other side of the equation. So I will wind up with negative 170 volts on the right hand side of this equation. So that is one of the mesh current equations that I need. The next thing that I need to tackle is I need to tackle um, what happens with mesh A and mesh B. Right. So for mesh A, again I'm going to invoke Kirchhoff's voltage law, which says that the potential across resistor 1 plus the potential that's developed across this current supply, which we don't know what that is yet. So I'm going to give that a variable name and I'm going to say that there's some unknown potential developed between here and here across this current supply. I'm going to call that I2. Okay, so V sub I2 plus the potential that's developed across this resistor right here, resistor R3. Right. All of that has to be equal to the potential that is uh, developed by this voltage supply right here, which is 50 volts. All right, so again, I'm going to use Ohm's law to rewrite these unknown voltages in terms of the uh, mesh currents that I've established here. So the only current that flows through resistor 1 is IA, so the potential there can be rewritten as IA times 5 ohms. I still don't have any method to determine the potential difference across this, um, across this current supply. So I'm going to keep that as V sub I2. Right. And the potential that's developed across resistor R3 is going to depend upon the com how current A combines with current C. So A is assumed to be going from right to left. And in our assumed direction here for I sub C, we assume that it was going from left to right. So since I'm writing the mesh A, I'm going to assume A is the dominant, and C is going to reduce that current flow. Oh, and the other thing we need to remember here is that we also already know the current flow through, um, through mesh C is 10 amps. Right. That is all going to be multiplied by the 15 ohms of resistance of R3, and all of that must sum to be 50 volts.
Okay. Notice that we still don't know the potential that's developed here. We need to develop another equation for our super mesh so that we can get rid of this unknown voltage potential. All right, so let's start working with mesh B. All right, with mesh B, we will use, uh, again, invoke Kirchhoff's voltage law and say that the potential that's developed across resistor 2 plus the potential that's developed across resistor 4 must be equal to the potential that is developed across this current supply, which we do not know yet. So that becomes Vi sub 2. Okay. So we can pretend that this is like a power supply. Right? We just don't know what the voltage potential is that's developed between here. Again, I can rewrite the voltage across R2 and R4 in terms of the unknown mesh currents. All right, so the only current that flows through R2 is IB. So I can rewrite that as IB times 10 ohms. And I can rewrite the uh, voltage across R4 in terms of the mesh IB and the mesh ID currents. IB and ID were both assumed to flow um, in the same direction. So through that resistor, it will be the combination of IB plus ID multiplied by the resistance of R4. All of that is going to be equal to the unknown voltage that's developed across this current supply right here. All right, so we don't know these, but luckily we have two equations and we can eliminate this unknown by plugging this result back into the mesh A equation. And in this manner, we're creating our super mesh equation. Of course, we're losing information about one equation, so we will have to establish a um, constraint equation to make up for that. Let's go ahead and combine these equations. And when I combine these equations to eliminate Vi2 as a variable, we wind up with something that looks like Ia times 5 ohms plus Ib times 10 ohms plus Ib plus I sub d times 5 ohms, plus Ia minus 10 amps times 15 ohms, must all equal 50 volts. All right, and now I'm going to perform a little bit of algebra because we know that we're going to need to uh, use some linear algebra here. Um, I'm going to rewrite by collecting all of the terms. And when I do that, I will get 20 ohms times Ia plus 15 ohms times I sub B plus 5 ohms times I sub D must all sum to 200 volts. Okay, so we have an equation for mesh D. We have a super mesh equation for mesh A and B. All right, we also said that we are going to need a constraint equation um, to help us uh, ultimately get to the final solution. So we have the two mesh equations. Now we need to work with the constraint equation. To develop the constraint equation, we need to somehow relate the current in mesh A to the current in mesh B. All right. All right, since both of these meshes share this 5 amp current supply, and based on our assumed direction of current flow, we know that IB is going to flow through this current supply from the bottom to the top, and we've assumed that the uh, current IA is going to flow from the top to the bottom. So they are going to offset each other. And the way to write that would be IB minus IA. Okay. IB minus IA have to, after we combine them together, must be equal to the 5 amps of total current. All right, so our, so our constraint equation tells us that the combination of A and B currents must total 5 amps. All right, and that becomes our constraint equation. What I'm going to do again is I'm going to rearrange this uh, into a form that's more friendly for a matrix algebra solution.
So now, all told, I have developed the three equations that are necessary for solving this circuit. I have my mesh D equation, my super mesh equation, and my constraint equation. What I'm going to do is uh, rewrite those quickly. All right. Okay, so again I have my mesh D equation, my super mesh equation from A and B combined, and my constraint equation. And we see that this is in a, uh, is, we see that we have three equations in three unknown variables, which we can easily solve as a simultaneous system of equations. Solving it by whichever way you choose, you'll wind up with the fact that the current in mesh A is 4.46 amps. The current in mesh B is equal to 9.46 amps. And in mesh D, we wind up with negative 6.21 amps. Now, it's important to note what that negative sign means. When we started writing our equations, we made some assumptions about the direction of current flow through the circuits. All right, so we assumed that IA was clockwise, and IB was clockwise, and IC was clockwise, and that ID was counterclockwise. When we solve this system and notice that ID has a negative value to it, all that indicates is that we made an incorrect assumption. So nothing to worry about. Even though we assumed that the ID current went um, from the positive supply, it's from the positive terminal of the power supply to the negative terminal of the power supply. In reality, it actually goes the opposite direction. And in this case, what that means is that the power supply is actually absorbing some of the current or absorbing power in the system. All right, so in conclusion, what we've done here is we have um, solved the circuit completely using the mesh current method. Uh, to, to do so, we identified the meshes of the circuit. We looked at the special case that we had to combine two of the meshes together to form a super mesh. And because of that, we had to add a constraint equation to the mix. After doing so, we came up with three independent equations that allowed us to solve for all of the unknown currents in the system. Now that we know all of the unknown currents, we can combine those currents through the resistors to determine the potential drops everywhere in the circuit. So we know everything that we need to know about this circuit and its operation.